there may be a uh, tough time slot getting everyone first thing in the morning, but uh, not, the, not the worst I've had. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was presenting at a conference in New York. It was a Leaders in Performance conference, which is a really good group if any of you ever get the chance to go. Um, a lot of high-powered US executives in, in the room, and as I was waiting to present, I realized the guy before me was the founder of TED Talks who obviously is going to be good, and, <laughs> and his presentation was on how to give a good presentation. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he's, he's the guy to follow. Uh, what's worse is that the two main points I got out of his presentation was always be yourself, use language that you're comfortable with, uh, and never apologize. And I'm thinking, shit, that's, that's exactly how I start. I always start saying sorry for my accent and sorry because I mumble. Um, but yeah, speaking to mostly hungover Australians and Kiwis, I don't have to worry, I guess, too much. So, um, so this is me at the moment with, with San Antonio Spurs, uh, a physio by trade, uh, evolved into a, a high-performance manager type role, um, about to evolve again, uh, hopefully which, uh, which we can settle on something soon. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about this, which is the Injury Prevention Pyramid for Elite Sports Teams. Uh, it's a, a paper I wrote. Uh, four years ago, even though it, did, you know, it took a long time to come through the process of coming out. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, essentially this started when I first met with the Spurs about four and a half years ago. And I sat in a room uh, with the coach and with the GM, um, and they, they asked me two questions. They said, one, what can we do to have less injuries here? And two, how can we get better as athletes? And so focusing on the first question, I sort of I said, well, to be fair, I can't, I can't tell you that. You know, I, I can't tell you what you should do to prevent injuries because it's, it's very context specific and I don't know what you do now and I don't know the ins and outs of your program. Um, so the answer is, you know, I don't know or I can't tell you. And after a little bit of awkward silence where it was clear, clear that's not the answer they were looking for, I sort of, oh, well, I better say something else. So I said, look, philosophically, I can talk to you about how I think we should go about preventing injuries. And then I would have to spend time here at the club or you guys can take that idea and, and try and figure out how to use it in this specific environment. And so I basically stood up and I had a whiteboard and I started scribbling my thoughts of saying, well, you know, where do we start in preventing injuries? Uh, and it ended looking something like a triangle and that's, that's essentially where it came from. Um, what I'll do today is work through each of the, the key steps, uh, each of the key blocks um, one at a time, from list management to load management to athletic development. The three of those alone, for me, are probably the key to, to preventing injury and that they need to be done differently in every specific environment. But for me, they're the big blocks of, of preventing injury. Um, and then you add on to that improving movement efficiency using specific injury prevention programs, uh, your injury management techniques, uh, of course, there's some uncontrollables, and you know I've been a little bit criticised for allowing that to be mentioned. But in the reality of professional sport, I think we we have to acknowledge we we don't control every single thing. Um, I'm going to go through each of these and give a, a very brief or a very basic explanation of why I think it's important. I will try to then add to that a very simple example of of in my career how how I've used that, just so it's not completely philosophical, and and hopefully will give you something. Uh, a little bit more interesting to consider. Before I do, but I, I want to make a particular point about the two things that, that I listed at the side of this pyramid, because for me, these have a moderating effect at every level. The psychosocial influences around a player and the culture around a club, uh, and you could argue also the culture, cultural background of a player as well, but when I wrote that, I was more considering it as the culture of the club, have a huge effect on that player's ability to function with pain, their ability to play through certain conditions that other players may or may not play through. And that has obviously a huge effect on injury prevention. It's, to me, you know, throughout 20 years in professional sport, obviously I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made mistakes in a physio sense of of misdiagnosis or, or poor rehab. Uh, I've made mistakes in a management sense of getting loadings right or getting monitoring tools right. Um, 
But the biggest mistakes I feel I've made are, are in this psychosocial area, either not recognising it for the influence that it is, which, which is huge, or recognising it but not being able to actively do something to improve it. And as I say, the biggest failures that I've had personally, I think have come through failure to recognise how that can affect every single level throughout this pyramid. Um, and I used to be very much more drawn to the hard sciences, to looking for something that had evidence that could show me this, is, this injury is caused by this and this is the treatment type that best affects it. Um, and as I've become more experienced, I've become more drawn to understanding that, that psychosocial influence is on a player. That player's background, that player's past experience with injury, family from management, from fans, from coaches, um, and the significant effect that they have on how each player deals with, with each different problem. And I think more and more the hard sciences are supporting that. When you look at us moving further away from diagnostic tools in the medical sense, you know, because you can get an MRI that looks exactly the same in two players, and yet the physical effect on those players is completely different. So all the information is valuable, but it, it's all moderated by that. And the culture in a club moderates things. I've been in different environments where the culture around injury prevention, injury management, varies 100%. I've been in clubs where it was super, it's super conservative and we're not going to take any risks at all. And if we leave the player out for longer, that's better as long as we don't take a risk of recurrence. And, I, and I've been looked upon as super aggressive in my role because I want to push people. I've been in the other environment where the club and the culture in the club is very aggressive and they looked at me as if I was, I was really passive you know, in trying to hold people back. Um, but how that culture of your club, and there's pros and cons at either end of the scale, and like most things in life, being somewhere in the middle is, is probably the best, but that culture has a huge effect on your injury rates as well. So although I'll walk, I'll walk through the pyramid, you know, just keep in mind that for me, those two things have a huge effect at every level, and you have to keep them in mind uh, at every stage if you're trying to prevent injury in whatever environment you're in. <clears throat> List management. It's the, the bottom of the pyramid. If you have the right group of players who are well suited to what you're going to ask them to do, you've got a much better chance of preventing injuries. Yeah. We can argue about <clears throat> in, internal durability of some players versus others, and I know that we can always improve that, but to me it's, it's a simple fact that some players are inherently more durable than others. And maybe that's a collagen makeup, maybe it's a DNA thing, or maybe it's the psychosocial surrounding that that player has grown up with and their experience and what they're able to deal with. Um, but understanding that getting the right players to do what you want them to do, so you know, that will be able to cope with the style that you want them to play in and fit into the position you want them to play in is, is hugely important. If you're starting with you know, round pegs in square holes, you're going to make it a lot more difficult for yourself to keep those guys fit and healthy. Just out of interest, if you started with these three sports with these three guys, you'd have a pretty good chance of one, not getting injuries, and you'd also have a pretty good chance of winning a lot of games. So um, key players in clubs can affect the culture, uh, and building a list around key players like this can, can make a huge difference. The main points when you're considering list management, firstly is understanding the demands, not just the demands of your sport, not just the demands of each position within your sport, but the demands that tactically that the tactical approach of your coach is going to apply in those positions and understand that different players are going to be suited for different roles. Now, if a, if a coach wants to move a player, if you're talking in football in soccer terms and a coach wants to move a central defender to be a wide defender and then wants to move, wants to play, you know, play him as a wing back, the physical demands of that player are going to be very different. And he may or may not be well suited to do that. And that's a conversation you need to have with your coaching staff. You know, it's the coaching staff's decision to make. And, and our role from a performance perspective is just to have the conversation with them so they're aware of, of what risks are involved. Um, so understand the demands that are going to be on each of your players and then understand each of the individuals you have. Know their history, know where their weaknesses are, know what their risks are going to be, know how well they've coped with different situations in the past. Uh, know what their experience of different situations was, was in the past. 
and try to pair them up, those up as much as you can. And if you can't, at least make sure everyone is aware of that. And sometimes the risk is worth the reward, but everyone has to understand that if your goal is preventing injuries, you have to take those things into account. And the last point on this slide is understand what you're trying to achieve. And I put that there specifically because this is a, a presentation on how to prevent injuries. But what is our goal? If you're a high performance manager or you're working in any of the high, any of the high performance roles, be it medical or sports science or strength and conditioning, what is your goal at the club? Your goal is to win if you're at a professional club. Your goal is not to have the least injuries. Now there is somewhat of a correlation between the two. You know, if your best players are injured, it's hard to win. But it's not a direct correlation because depending on which player is injured against, you know, against w in which position and what coverage you have and against what team, it's very different. And ultimately, your goal is not to build a squad that won't get hurt. Your, your job is to build a squad that will win. And sometimes, you know, the Spurs are a good example in that if you've drafted low, you know, in, in basketball, you've only got five players on the court. One player can make a significant difference. If you draft a player from the top 10, he can come into a team and make that team significantly better. If you're drafting a low player because you're already a strong team and you're drafting in you know, the late 20s, the Spurs have done for most of the last 20 years, that player's unlikely to come in and make your team significantly better unless you find a player who, for some reason, has the ta a talent level that was higher up, but other teams passed him over. And so for us, it was looking at players who were injury risks and looking at players who might have been top 10 players in terms of talent, but other teams didn't want to take them on because there was a significant risk involved in taking them on. Now for us, the risk is, okay, we, we take this kid on. He, he may not play based on what we know. Will he withstand NBA loads? Maybe not. So, you know, for an injury risk perspective, it's very high. But if he does manage to play, he could make us a better team. Whereas if we pick the next kid at 28, the simple fact is he doesn't have the talent to make us any better. So there's no risk from an injury perspective, but we're also not getting better as a team. So understand that we're trying to win. So I'm talking to our coaches about the makeup of our list and the makeup of our squad from an injury prevention perspective, but I'm acknowledging to them all the time that that's not our primary goal. And we're willing to take risks if you guys feel, you guys being the coach in the GM, feel it's worthwhile to do that to give us a better chance to, of success. One example that, I, that, I'll, that I'll talk about, one specific example. At the end of the season, two years ago, I'm sitting in a list meeting with our coach and the GM, a couple of the assistant coaches, and we go through our depth chart on the board. And typically, you know, you've got positions one to five and you have three players in each position, your squad of 15. So we got to point guards and we love the point guard roster we had, so the coaches moved straight on. Point guards, no problems. Shooting guards. And I had to put my hand up and say, well, oh, hang on, let's, let's just talk about the point guards just so everyone's aware where we're at. What do you mean? We've got a, we've got a perfect list. We've got, a, a, albeit ageing, a veteran, but, but superstar, a guy who's going to be a Hall of Famer. We've got a guy coming off the bench as their number two who's, who's a Ferrari, who plays in the 50th percentile of minutes for, for point guards in the NBA, but is in the 93rd percentile for high intensity work rate, despite playing only half the minutes of most point guards. We love him, he's fantastic. And we've got this young kid we drafted last year who's going to be a monster. He's, he could be anything, he grew an inch. He grew an inch in height in the first season we had him as a rookie. And he's 19 years old and you know, we're really happy with that roster. So okay, so let's just be aware. The old fella got injured in the third last game of the season and has had surgery. So he's not gonna play for the first month or two of the season. Oh, that's fine, we've got the other two. Yeah? One's a good experienced point guard who plays flat out and one's a young kid who can get some more time. Okay, let's just, on those two, we've got this guy in the middle who's a Ferrari and he's played 21 minutes a game for the last four or five years of his career. He's now 28. What you all love about him is how hard that he plays. You know, that's what you all love about him. We know from a medical perspective, he's got a few little niggly issues, but he doesn't complain, he gets on with it, never misses a, never, never misses a minute. But if you ask him to keep that intensity up and to take the extra 10 or 15 minutes a game that's gonna be required in that first two months, 
just be aware that two things are going to happen. Either one, he's not going to give you the output that you're used to, and he won't be that Ferrari because he's balls out as it is to get through his 21 minutes. Um, or he'll try and stay balls out, and he's a pretty good chance of getting injured. And then you're down to just one point guard. And let's talk about the young kid. He grew an inch in that, in that last season. He didn't miss a minute of time because he, he's not playing a lot. He's only playing five, ten minutes a game. He also has a bone stress injury in his pubic bone, you know, related to the increase in training loads, related to the growth that he's still undergoing. That's fine. He, he can play with it. He didn't miss any minutes this year because of what he was being asked to do. But if you ask him to step up, he's at risk of breaking down. So before we move on, and, and don't worry about point guards for our list. Just be aware, in that first two months, we might end up with none. Now, I'm not saying we should recruit a point guard. That's not my decision to make. But I want all the coaches and the GMs to understand that you're taking a level of risk if you don't consider that, 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 list, that list that you've got. So I mean, these types of conversations, and we're really lucky with the Spurs. And I've been uh, lucky at some of the other clubs I've been at that, that they'll listen to that conversation. And I, I'm not trying to influence who they pick because I don't know anything about basketball. And it's, and it's not my call to make, but it's my call to give them that information. You know? What it came down to then was we had a 15th spot on the roster. Should we go for a, an experienced point guard who we may get use out of in the first couple of months and then probably won't use again? Or should we use an extra, should we go for the, the third big, which is, which is what that roster spot would, would t typically be for? And then that went to a coach's debate and the coaches who's available as an experienced point guard, who's available as a third big, what will happen if we don't get the third big, okay, well, our first big, you're gonna have to play more minutes. Well, he wants to play more minutes anyway. The conversation went around and at so be it, they signed a, a fourth point guard. Um, and as it worked out, that fourth point guard played 10, 15 minutes for the first month, which meant our other two didn't have a problem. Yeah, the old fella came back, didn't play very well, but yeah. <laughs> um, but that's how the conversation around managing your list with respect to injury should happen, in, in my opinion. Um, and it's not to say don't pick a player, it's just to make people aware of the discussions that, that you should be having. Once you've established you've got a list of players that you think is suitable for, for what you're going to ask them to do, then you've got to get into load management. Because every player will have their breaking point. And it's up to us to, to try and figure out firstly where that is and then secondly to try and improve that, push that further away. This is what it looked like to me from coming from a physio background when I first started sitting with sports scientists and then explaining it to me. Um, but over time, you know, it becomes much simpler, maybe because I dumb it down into my head and I get them to repeat it to me over and over again until I understand exactly what we're saying. But um, once you've got that list of people, if you manage them correctly, Again, you're not going to prevent all injuries, but you've got to, you're giving yourself a much better base for preventing injuries uh, across the season or across the tournament. The key points in load management. Firstly, understanding both external and internal loads are, are required. I was watching a presentation by a guy from Man United, uh, Robin Thorpe, who's a sports scientist there, and he's much cleverer than me. And He had this point, but he explained it by having uh, five photos of Man United players, you know, of their faces, and then they all went through the same external load, and then they all spread to different areas of internal response. And he, he was using that as an example to say the exact same external load on different players produces a completely different response. So looking at external loads only is, is not going to be enough. You have to use external loads and use your acute to chronic ratios and use whatever approach you want to predict what you're likely to get, but then you have to measure what actually happened to, to each individual player and use that to then adjust moving forward. And you could look at it from the same player and the same external load can produce a different response week upon week or day upon day. So finding, I know everyone in this room or everyone who's, who's in the performance space can probably have days, weeks of arguments on what's the best metric for each thing. Honestly, find one, find something that is reliable and valid and you can get consistently that measures the external load and find something that's reliable and valid that measures how players are responding to that and stick with it. And, and for me, you don't need to get too bogged down in which one is better than others. And they're, they're the conversations you have with your sports scientists and you have them over coffee or over beers late at night and you evolve over periods of time to try new things. But 
it's about getting an, an internal and an external loads and, and getting them consistently. Um, try and identify them specifically to your sport. You know, they're different in basketball to what they were in, in rugby league and in, in soccer in my background. Um, and they're different for different positions, even within each sport. Uh, not so much in basketball, because there's not a, as big of a difference in the demands in each players, but there is a difference in the physiology of the players. Um, and individualization. You know, when we set uh, you know, acute to chronic loads, for instance, with, with the Spurs, it's done at different time frames for different players for different reasons. Yeah, the example in that being, well, actually, I'll, I'll bring a couple of examples up, so I'll, I'll talk through it then. The key to load management, one of the keys is to develop actionable data. And by actionable data, I mean, firstly, it's reliable. So it's going to tell you the same thing if the same thing is, is true. Secondly, it's valid, as in it's showing you something that's meaningful. Uh, and third, it's timely. You can get it quickly. You know, there's not a lot of value in getting information so late that you can't do anything about it. So actionable data to me is reliable, valid, and quick. Uh, I should add to that, and practical. If it's hard to collect, you're probably not going to get it quickly. Uh, it's going to be a pain in the ass, and then you're going to miss data points, um, and eventually you won't get as good at data. So whichever you choose, make sure it's actionable, and then obviously make sure you take action from it. You know, collecting it all and not telling anyone about it is a waste of time. Collecting it all and thinking that should dictate the program is also a waste of time. You know, the coaches should dictate the program. But collecting it all and using it as part of the advice you can give for coaches to help them make better decisions is where it's appropriate. And last point on this, and it's probably more just a, you know, a bugbear of mine, but understand the analysis of the metrics. And by that I mean, it's one of the things, a pet hate of mine when I hear coaches talking about, we dominated this team physically because we ran more. We did twice as many high speed meters than they did. And, or a team says, well, our average high speed meters is this, and now we're, in this game we did 20% more. So that means we're 20% fitter. And to me, that's really a misuse, a misunderstanding of the stats. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here, but it's an easy sell that sometimes is given to coaches or is thrown out to the media. And it, it ultimately is a negative for all of us because it's making claims that aren't true. You know, if a player runs more in a game, it doesn't mean he's fitter than the player he was playing against or he's fitter than what he was last week. It means that's what he had to do in the game. It's really important to know because if you know what he's doing in a game, you can prepare him better. If you know what he's doing and what he did in the game is different to what he's used to, you can recover him differently. It's, it's really important information. But it's wrong to suggest that that shows he's fitter than someone else or he's better than someone else because some of the best players move the least. And some of the, um, Matt talking about the referees yesterday saying, you know, the better referees run the least, yet they're still in the best position. You know, when, when all the GPS, explosion happened I guess 15 12 years ago I was in the UK going to a few different football clubs and I remember getting to Blackburn when Big Sam was in charge and for whatever criticisms people have of his football style he's always been very open to new technologies and he was one of the first to, to go into it in a big way and I didn't know much about it and I sat in a meeting with him and some of his staff and they described to me how every time we out sprint the opposition we win so that's our goal is to out sprint the opposition Okay, that, that sounds reasonable. I, I don't know that much about it, but yeah. I went down to Chelsea two weeks later and they gave me the exact opposite information. They said, every time that we run further than the opposition, we've lost. You know, and it's because it's tactically dependent. You know, if, if Blackburn at the time were a long ball team and a lot of their game was based on bombing long balls into the box and, and sending multiple forward people chasing it, they were covering more distance. Every time there was a dead ball, their two central defenders go up forward to try and win the header. As soon as that ball is played, they have to sprint all the way back to get back into position to defend. So their high speed running was not coming in an effective way. It was mostly coming from their central defenders sprinting back from being forward from long balls. So it, it wasn't making, it didn't mean they were fitter than anybody else. It didn't mean they were working harder than, well, 
technically those central defenders were working harder because they had to run more, but they were doing it because of the tactical approach. And so while the information is great to have, we have to be wary that we don't oversell what it is. You know, it's physical representation of what a player did. And we can use that great in our physical preparation, but we shouldn't overanalyze that. And we shouldn't tell a player, you did better today because you ran more. Because they may have played worse. And going back to my two point guard examples, the, the old fella runs a third of the Ferrari in every game. And there's no doubt, as much as I love the Ferrari, that the, the old fella is a better player. You know, no one doubts that, but that's the styles that, that they play. Um, the, you know, being smarter, being more tactically aware, these things have, have a lot to do with your outcome of your performance. So dictating the outcome on the basis of how much you ran, for me, it's a mistake. I thought I would show you a couple of quick examples of, of how we've used or how we've presented the, the load management just to keep it less philosophical. Um, this is you know, live data from the Spurs at the moment. This is the way we look at it as a group in the HPU. Um, we use uh, a camera system in games. We're not allowed to have wearables. Uh, in training we use catapult, um, but we only have the accelerometry component because we're inside, obviously we don't get the GPS. RFID is something we're trialling at the moment. Um, they're the key metrics we look at. You know, they're the key uh, acute to chronic ratios we look at. Um, to give you an idea of how we present it to the players and coaches, we take each of those metrics, they would get one sheet with six of these different graphs. Um, and this would show the metric that, that we're using, the individual game load being along the bottom, and then the different acute to chronic ratios across the top. With this particular player, we're looking at his last three days relative to his three day average from the 27 days prior to that. Uh, and we're looking at his last seven days relative to the previous 21 days prior to that. The time frames we use vary for every player depending on the consistency of their minutes. You know, if you're looking at a uh, LaMarcus Aldridge or Manu Ginobili who play very consistent minutes every week, we can use bigger time frames because it will give us a, a, a more accurate average of what they used to. If you're looking at a Kyle Anderson or a Davies Bertans who maybe play 30 minutes one game, then they don't play for a week. We use much shorter time frames because giving them long periods is going to dumb down the average of what they're used to. So our sports scientist, Javi Schelling, is responsible for, for both of these graphs. And all the graphs I'll show you are not done by me. They're all done by the sports science staff at places I've been who are far smarter than me. And I just continually bug them to ask them what things mean and ask them if they can show me something else. And, and, you know, and we adjust things over time. Uh, taking a step back to, to the NRL, Cole's probably seen these. Uh, Jay Stellani was a sports scientist who put this together. This is one example of how we looked at training loads and training response uh, side by side. Uh, used different, you know, we used the numbers from that session, the subacute load, which was a three day load, a seven day load, and then a, a seven to 28 day load comparison. And each of those things could get flagged based on the same, same time frame comparison. Um, and then obviously we looked at the different wellness reporting some counter movement jumps and some fitness testing and body composition scores. Going back to a football example for the soccer people here, um, this is put together by Fergus Connolly at Liverpool. Um, I really like this when he put it together. I love the, you know, our key metrics were across the top. He allowed us, he allowed these were all drop downs and I could choose, do I want to look at data from today's session compared to a game or compared to a training session? compared to the matching training session of that day, game minus one session, game minus two session, et cetera. And do I want to look at compared to the max they've ever done in that, in that session, the average they've done for that session, or the least they've ever done for that session? Um, and so here, obviously, we've compared each player to the max they've ever done in a game. Um, he, after this, he also included uh, an option to look at rolling averages, to look at three-day periods or seven-day periods. So it's just a different way to present some of the data to try and make um, give you a little practical example, I guess, so, so not, not just a completely philosophical discussion. Uh, this is how we presented it to the players, and that was just stuck up on their walls. The next step, if we agree that we've got the right group of players, we agree that we're, we have to manage their loads and try and get them to do what they're able to cope with, is can we make them better athletes? And that will actually improve what they're able to cope with. 
uh, improve their durability, um, as well as making them better athletes. I don't know if this is a real transformation or not. That was just when I Googled athletic development, that was a picture that came up. So um, had no involvement with me, obviously. Some key points with athletic development. Obviously, it needs to be sport specific. It needs to be position specific if you can within that sport. And even better, it needs to be individually specific. Time demands, uh, practicality often means you know, you lump groups together and sometimes that's the way it has to be. But the more position, the more individual specific your athletic development programs can be, the better. It also needs to be period specific. Are you in mid competition? Are you in pre-season? Are you in off-season? And this for me is a key point, that it should be integrated. Your strength coach, your sports scientists, medical staff, your coach and the players themselves all need to have input into their athletic development. Coaches and players need to tell you what they think they need and what they're comfortable to do. Medical staff need to give input into what they feel a player needs. Sports scientists should be giving continual feedback to strength coaches about the best way to, to do, to achieve certain goals. And ultimately, your strength coach may be the guy who designs the, the, the strength workouts that they do uh, and, and implements those programs. What you should agree upon, and, and whatever your content is, and I'll touch on content very, very briefly because it's, it's way too specific for this, uh, this type of a group. You know, content depends on the player, on the sport, on the position. Um, but what you can agree upon is the methodology you're going to approach as a group to athletic development, how you're going to structure your programs, and then you can agree on that content in your specific situation. So by this I mean, you know, with our group at the Spurs, we sat down at the start and said, what's our methodology? For me, it's three, it's three simple steps. Firstly, it's assessment. It's assessment of the sport. What are the demands of the sport for this position, this player? And let's establish what they are so we can make sure we, we're setting out things that will help us achieve them. And let's assess this player individually and say, what are the individual needs, needs, weaknesses of this player that we need to add over and above the generic um, goals of the sport? Second is how we're going to implement them. Let's agree on. If we say a player lacks power, well, let's have a program that delivers power. If we say a player lacks base strength, well, let's have a player, let's have a program that will deliver base strength. So let's design sets and rep schemes, periodization around those specific goals, and let's agree on how we're going to implement specifics to, to get to what we've assessed as the issue, and let's continually review to see if we're making it. Now, testing as much as possible, I think we all agree, should be done as part of training. You know, you don't want to give up training days to keep retesting things. So if you can test within training, that's great. But you do need to keep retesting to see if you're, you're having success with the programs you're implementing. To be specific in terms of the structure, this is how we do it at the Spurs. It's going to be different in everyone's situation. We talk about pre-session, people being in a weight room. They'll do isometric work. They'll do proprioceptive work. They'll do core and they'll do movement efficiency. We try and do that pre-training, pre-game. During trainings and games is functional strength. You know, obviously in the games we don't have control over it, but we may design some drills as part of practice to give them true functional strength. Uh, and for our strength and power development, it comes in our heavier lifts, which we do post, post sessions. One to three times a week, depending on where we're at in the season and, and how many minutes a player is playing. Everyone lifts at least once a week. Um, we're lucky at the Spurs that we've got three dedicated strength coaches. We've got an intern, we've got myself. So we've got five different people who can run the strength sessions. We've only got 15 players. So all our strength sessions are one-on-one, -on -one, um, which makes them individualized, which is great. And they're all done at completely different times, depending on the schedule. Some of those players lift immediately post-game. Some players lift the morning of the game if they're not expected to play that much that night. Some players lift the day after a game, depending on what our upcoming schedule is. But we're all responsible. or. Our, our head strength coach is responsible to make sure everyone is scheduled to get between one and three lifts in a week, depending on where we're at in the season. In terms of content, this one maybe is the most controversial, but this is only my opinion. This is not based on, on anything other than my experience and, and what I felt we needed in our particular situation. Firstly, you know, the heart of it being individualised, and with our squad and our staff, that's, that's quite easy to do. So we moved away from when I arrived. There was team lifts that the coach dictated and everyone did the same thing. Um, so the first thing we did was really change it to a more individualized system. The key points that I made to our strength coaches, and I let them design the program because I'm not a strength coach and, and I don't have the knowledge and I don't want to be a strength coach, 
Um, but I do have theories from my experience that I wanted to impart and said, these are the things I want you to think about in general. First one was making sure that we addressed horizontal force production of muscle. You know, I felt there was probably in some places I've been a, a, a bias on too much vertical strength development and there is some good work that's come out of some guys at the AIS um, who were focused on calf, calf muscles but showing the, the dramatic difference in stress on the muscle when it's producing horizontal force versus vertical force. So I asked our strength coaches to consider that and when we measure our strength typically we were doing it with a counter movement jump um, but we also added in a, a sled pull exercise so we had a horizontal lower body strength uh, test as well. Um, moving to the eccentric side, you know, obviously everyone understands the benefits of eccentric exercise for a number of things. Some of the key points that, that I wanted to impart to our group were one of the advantages of eccentric exercise, and this has been shown particularly with hamstrings, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's fairly generalizable. One of the advantages is, is changing the length tension relationship within a muscle. So training the hamstring eccentrically will mean it can produce force further out at a longer length. And this is, this is where a hamstring gets injured, so that's important. You don't get that change in length tension relationship if you do an eccentric and concentric component to an exercise. You still get stronger, so it's still worth doing, but you're not getting a change in length tension, length tension relationship. To get that, you need to have an eccentric only exercise. So if you're doing a Nordic, it needs to be a Nordic to the ground and then walk back up on the hands as opposed to down and then back up. That's not to say it's wrong to do it the other way, not at all, and you'll still get strong. You just won't get that one particular part of the exercise that I think is important from an injury prevention perspective. Uh, we progressed them to having a short uh, SSC, so they end up catching at the end of those eccentric exercises, again, because that's more of functional stress on the muscle. And when I say paired for two joint muscles, I mean if you're doing significant amounts of Nordics or you know, a knee dominant, knee dominant hamstring exercise, you need to have some hip dominant hamstring exercises as well you know, for, for your two joint muscles. When we talk about complex movement patterns here, I'm talking about, I guess, coming from a rehab perspective, but if someone has uh, an imbalance from one leg to the other, post-injury or, or maybe pre-injury, um, and we can test that well now with, with dual force plates, we can do a, a double leg jump, which will show us an imbalance, and we can do single leg jumps repeated. Um, what should your approach be? Should you double the amount of work you're doing on the, on the weaker side? In, in my personal preference is to keep it the same. You may have to adjust the weight that you're doing, the resistance that you're applying, so you're working to fatigue on both legs. But my personal preference has always been still to balance the exercises from one leg to the other. My theory being that the, the side with the deficit will get better quicker and will eventually catch up but it's better to still prepare the body in a consistent uh, and balanced way. There's been times where I've had to, where I've veered away from that because we weren't making the gains we needed. So, you know, it's, it's not locked in stone by any means, but it's, it's a preference of mine. And I also included some essential isolated muscles. A lot of the work that we do now is, is compound exercise. A lot of it is, is combined joint movement. And the problem with that, from a, particularly from a rehab perspective, is is muscles can be shielded and someone can achieve the same end point without necessarily improving the specific muscle that, that is weak. And if you leave them with a specific muscle that's weak, they, they have a higher risk moving forward. The couple that I nominate, nominated, soleus and upper range of gastrox. This comes from the work of Andy Franklin Miller, who's done a lot of the 3D analysis in Dublin, has a fantastic clinic. And they were able to show an association with, with footballers with groin pain and decreased ankle plantar flexion. So that was one thing. Jill Cook, obviously, who I'm sure everyone's heard of, um, out of Melbourne, uh, tendon specialist. Uh, she has a lot of clinical focus on soleus strength because of its ability to work eccentrically when you're in a closed chain position in stopping the shank coming forward. And it doing that, then taking pressure off the anterior tendon structures. Um, and upper range of gastrox Clinically, she spends a lot of time invested in that because it prevents a rotation uh, or an, a valgus position of the knee that adds to, to anterior knee tendon load. So I think there's some good support out there for working those muscles 
in an isolated way, and that means you need to test those muscles and re-measure those muscles in an isolated way. Obviously with hamstrings, my best example of that is we had a kid who we were considering drafting. He was seven months post ACL. We brought him in for workouts. He, was, he had been fully cleared by his doctor and by, more importantly by his manager, who's the head of the life of the NBA. So um, he came on, did his workout on the court, looked fine. Came in, our head physio assessed him, said, looks, looks really good. We took him into the weight room, got him on the force plates. He could jump in the 90th percentile for player in his position. So he could jump high, had zero imbalance. Uh, we're like, wow, this kid's great. He's recovered really well. Last thing, let's put him on a Nord board and just test his hamstring strength. And he had a 40% deficit from one hamstring to the other. And this is despite the fact he was fully functional. He could jump as high as any kid in the NBA for his position. He could play normally, he looked normal to a physio, he still had a 40% isolated hamstring deficit. He had a hamstring graft. Um, so for me, that's a huge injury risk going forward if you haven't trained that muscle in an isolated way. He's managed to learn to jump using both legs exactly the same, but he's not using the hamstring the same on that leg. Um, similar, similarly with adductors, my personal experience particularly in footballers with long-term chronic adductors is normally as physios telling strength coaches, don't do any adductor work. We need to download, we need to deload his adductor because you know, his adductor enthesopathy is sore. And the problem with that is if you continually to deload something, it gets weaker and weaker. And it's tough when you're trying to take load off an area to let it settle, but you also need to make that area stronger. So I think it's something I've always believed that you need to keep trying to strengthen the adductors in an isolated way so they're not shielded. Um, and it's something now with the, the Copenhagen protocol uh, of exercises that I think n you know, now has some really good evidence to support it as well. Uh, so everyone feel free to argue with me later about why that's all crap, but that's only, that's only my opinion to try and give you something uh, a little more specific. Again, to give you some examples, this is a, a one quarter of a draft report that we produce at the Spurs, this will show you some of the things that we test on the draft guys coming in. Basic anthro measures, which in basketball are huge, much bigger than probably in other sports. When you're talking about wingspan and so on, our scouts go through the roof if, if someone ranks in a high percentile. This, this ranks them against everyone we've measured in history in their position as a percentile. So this kid, anthrop anthropometrically, was through the roof and everyone loved him. He had some other problems which made his risk high, but yeah, that, that, came, that comes up later. When he comes in, we did some force plate testing of explosive strength, of elastic strength and reactive strength. We do a max vertical jump because we can always get that even if the force plates aren't there. Speed, acceleration, agility, reaction time, aerobic capacity and recovery, and upper body power, which is kind of useless for basketballers, but it's something that they've always measured, so we just kept doing it. Um, we compared their availability over the last, well, however many years they've played. In this, in this kid's case, it was, it was four, um, including the minutes that they played. Because you know, if you play 100% of games, um, but you're not playing many minutes, or you know, obviously that has an effect. We have some basic movement efficiency screening, which I'll talk about next. I'm not actually a massive fan of it because it's too subjective, but you know, we did it, and the same with the range of motion profile. The rest of this report would include a full page medical summary uh, well, a half-page medical summary, sorry, a half-page shot clock, shot uh, chart, and a half-page scouting report on personality, on fit for the club, and, and so on. Um, back to the, to the Knights, and to give you an example of some of the measures that were getting taken there, uh, how they were being presented to players, body composition, aerobic capacity with, yeah, most people now are doing the modified yo-yos. I actually like to have a, a full yo-yo or a full beat test as well, because I think it measures something a little bit different. It's not necessarily practical to do, you know, on a on a day-to-day, -day, on a week-to-week -week basis, because you're taking players to exhaustion. But seeing who, which players, how hard players will push themselves, does give you different information. You know, a, a lot of the the end end result of a of a max beat test is is psychological. It's how hard a player is willing to push himself, and that may be something that's that you don't get from the modified stuff that's still worth having. Um, speed, obviously, same counter movement jump for explosive strength, elastic strength, upper body power, far more important in this, uh, in this case. Uh, decrease the, the functional movement down to, to one simple test. Gave them comparisons against their 
their position and against the squad best. Yeah, before moving on from that, I would say those three building blocks, for me, are 90% of injury prevention. Establishing that you've got an appropriate list of players, managing their loads as well as you can, and making them fitter and stronger. If you do those three things well, you've moved the big rocks of injury prevention, and you're setting yourself up for longer term success in, in keeping, keeping injury rates low. The things you can add on that uh, can help. You know, you can be talking about the one percenters or the five percenters, but if you don't do those things well, it doesn't matter what else you do. You know, if you've got the wrong playing group, if you don't manage their loads appropriately and they're not fit enough or strong enough, it doesn't matter what else you do. And you can do lots of other fancy things, um, but you'll, you'll find it much more difficult. The next one is movement efficiency. My issue with this is recognising how subjective it is. Um, you know, describing what is an efficient way to do a, a particular movement is generally subjective. We have a Vicon system at the Spurs. We're very lucky with the technology. I think that's my next point is, you know, utilise technology if you have it. Most people don't have that. And it means it is very subjective. So just be aware of that. And allow for individual variance. You know, I remember going back to, to that picture of Michael Johnson. And when he first started, you know, was on the scene however long it was ago, breaking every record in 400s, people were talking about how awkward his running style was. You know, because it hadn't been seen with someone so upright before. Actually, he's an incredibly in efficient way to run. And his core strength must be, must be amazing. But you know, recognize the individual variance. You know, the same way with Usain Bolt and his anthropometry. People wouldn't have expected him to be the greatest sprinter of all time, but um, individual variance has to happen. If you're trying to change something to do with movement efficiency, focus on the big things. If you're training a 100 metre sprinter, very minor changes in technique may be important. If you're training an Olympic gold medal level 100 metre sprinter, if you're training a rugby league player, a rugby league referee, a footballer, an AFL player, and they've got to take what you teach them in sprinting and take it into a game context situation. Those really subtle things, I'm not convinced we can change them when they're in the heat of the battle and they're going back to relying on all the other things going on and reacting to everyone else. So move the big rocks. If they've got obvious things that need to improve, then, then focus on them. When you do that, you do it by being repetitive, practicing the same thing over and over again by giving them feedback, by practicing in a context specific way and by being able to show them functional gains. Showing them at the end of the day that you kept doing it, you kept doing it, and now here's a video that shows you in a game where you look better in doing this particular movement that we were, that we were worried about. Uh, one example, again, to try and keep it a little bit more practical. Um, we, we did draft one guy at the Spurs. It's not this guy, and it's random pictures I found on the internet again. We drafted a guy who'd had two ACLs and so hadn't played for two years. Same knee, had done an ACL, had come back and done it again. <clears throat> and so we got him low in the draft because no one else wanted to necessarily take a punt on this kid. No one knew if he was actually going to be able to come back and play, um, which is fair. But we looked at him and said, well, if he, you know, if he comes back and plays, he could be good and he will make a difference to us. And if he doesn't play, well, our next best option wasn't going to make us better anyway. So for us, it was worth the risk. One of the ways that we could use technology in talking about his movement efficiency was during his rehab. And again, we're very lucky, but we have force plate sunk into the floor, very open to the, to the training court. So as he was stepping up his training loads, as opposed to being um, purely prescriptive and saying, okay, we're gonna take this amount of player load today and then we're gonna stop. What we would do is at each natural break in a session, he would walk to the side of the court and he would do three counter movement jumps with video analysis. And we could get on the spot feedback about was there any change in the height he was jumping or any change in his imbalance. And we could use that to decide he's not under fatigue, he can keep going more and keep doing more basketball drills. And then eventually he would come off and you would see a significant change in either his power output or the imbalance between his legs and we would stop the session there. And say, okay, you're at the point of fatigue, we're not gonna keep pushing you now and, and get into a higher risk zone. We could then come back later in the evening you know, to do the analysis from the video to see how his technique was changing when he got under fatigue and then talk to our strength coach and our physio about what we might do about that, what exercise we could add in to, to prevent the changes that were coming when he was under fatigue. So that's a way I think we use technology well to address, to address the movement efficiency exercise issue.
Next, cab off the rank, injury prevention programs. And I know I've rambled on, so I'm going to go quickly through this. I used to love this. When we first got to Liverpool, we introduced every day players are going to come into the indoor program. They're all going to do a circuit of injury prevention exercises. You can see on Stevie's face how much he loved it. Um, and it was uh, something that I thought was, was going to be great, something there was good evidence out there for. In a practical sense for me, it, it, it didn't work all that well, mainly because the players got bored and, and hated it. So It's very useful if exposure is an issue. If you're not getting enough exposure to proprioceptive exercises or to some core programs, some eccentrics, putting it into a circuit is great. So depending on your situation, that can be really helpful. In our situation, we could do it individually, so we probably didn't need it. Same thing with your staffing. If your staffing is limited, an injury prevention circuit can be, it can be fantastic. Um, if you've got lots of staff and lots of time, you can probably do it in a more individualized way, which, which will stop boredom or you know, create better understanding. Education is still vital, probably an area we didn't do well enough to make the players understand why this was beneficial to them. Um, you obviously need to be aware of boredom and then poor performance in those exercises. Um, and you shouldn't be afraid to modify it. Individuals may need different individual injury prevention programs. Uh, obviously, as an example, plethora of literature out there on a program that's available at no cost to everyone. Um, jump on the internet and get it. And if you're working in a, a non-professional environment or even a professional environment where you don't have the staffing, do it. I mean, it, there's evidence it works um, and at least take some ideas from it. Last, or well, second last step up the pyramid, injury management. Why is injury management in an injury prevention talk? Um, obviously, early intervention can change progression and outcome. So a player has a problem. If you intervene early, you can prevent the injury going to the extent that it causes a missed game or causes a missed training session. So of course, injury management has an effect on your injury outcomes. Of course, it's relevant to recurrent injuries. How you manage your injuries affects the likelihood of them coming back. Two other points on this. There's always a risk versus reward in your decision making uh, when you're bringing a player back from injury. And this needs to have an integrated approach. You need to have not just the medical staff saying this player is fine to go. You need to have the medical staff saying it. You need to have the strength staff saying it. You need to have the player confident and on board with it. And you need to have the coach then confident in that decision. And what level of risk you're willing to take depends on the individual situation you're in and the individual personalities of each of those four different groups. And they don't all have to agree. I've been overruled by coaches multiple times, but I'm, I'm absolutely fine with that as long as the coach understands the risks and the rewards that are available. Um, and I've actually been overruled either way, where I've said a player is fine to go and he should be playing, and the coach has said, no, I want to keep him out. So that's fine as long as you understand we don't think he needs to. Um, and, and vice versa. I think a player needs another week. Coach will talk to the player and say, listen, you know, he says you need another week. I need you now. And obviously the coach and player's discussion wins out over, over my opinion. Um, and that player was fine, by the way, so I was wrong. But and it definitely needs an integrated approach. The last point I'll make on this, because this is a whole hour's worth of discussion, really for the, from a medical side, always consider complete care versus creating dependence. Players have to understand that you care about them. Players have to understand that you'll do whatever it takes to help them get better, that you're there for them, not just with the treatment you can offer them or the care that you can offer them, but from that psychological perspective. What you don't want to do is create dependence where a player feels he needs you. Yeah. Some of the treatments that physios do are helpful, of course, but some of, them, some of the very fine, very finicky things that people do when they say to a player, listen, you can't go out until you've seen me and I've, you know, I've adjusted your pelvis. And look, if the guy can run, let him run. Don't make him feel like he has to see you. Don't make him feel like he has to be dependent on you. Because what you're doing, for a very, very minute physical change, you're making a big psychological change in making that player feel like he's, he's not durable enough on his own. And for me, the more experience I've become, the more I understand it. The psychological effect is probably bigger. It's probably bigger than the hands-on effect you're going to have. If you can do both, if you can give them the hands-on care without taking away the fact that they should understand that they're durable and they can do it and they're fine and their body can cope with far more than we ever ask it to, 
Uh, and I've seen players with limbs hanging off keep going. You know, it doesn't mean they should, but it can be done. Um, finding that balance, I think, you know, when you're talking about injury management is, is something really important. Um, this was a random example. I when I was thinking, I couldn't find good pitches, so the, the, it's a hamstring tear. The top pitcher is supposed to, you know, you're overly conservative, you, you know, you're really caring. The second pitcher is you're being more aggressive or you're taking a leap of faith. Um, it made me think of a, a study that John Orchard did years ago from AFL data. And he looked at data of how long players were out with hamstring injuries. You know, obviously, you know, there's a lot of that data in the AFL, some great data. And he, he was able to show that teams who were more conservative and kept their players out for longer after initial injuries had less recurrences of hamstrings. What he was also able to show is those teams who had more recurrences because they were more aggressive also had less time lost in total over the season. So you know, his point essentially at that time was to say, if you have 10 hamstring injuries and you keep them all out five weeks, well, that's 50 weeks lost and you had no recurrences. If you have 10 hamstring injuries and you keep them all out three weeks, that's 30 weeks lost. And then you have three recurrences, that's 39 weeks lost. You're still 11 weeks better off. So being ultra conservative is not always beneficial if your goal is to keep players on the field. You know, it goes back to risk and reward and no one wants to have a recurrence because it makes us look bad. But honestly, I feel like a lot of performance staff, the bigger concern is worrying about them being responsible. You don't want to be the guy who said he was fine to play and then he got re-injured. So the easy way to get around that is to keep him out longer and be more conservative. That's not, not necessarily the optimal approach for your team. Um, but if you are going to be aggressive, everyone has to be on board with it. Players have to understand the risk. Coaches have to understand the risk. Um, and you go from there. Last point, luck. Uh, show of hands, who thinks there's any luck in injuries in professional sport? Okay. Some, not, not everyone. Th that's fine. It's, it's, it's open for debate. I was pretty heavily criticised by a few lecturers. Um, my point with regards to this is there are lots of things that we can and should do to decrease injury rates. And we should be held responsible for injury rates if we're in a performance staff. So it's not to divert responsibility at all, you know, because this is our job. 